Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast presented by Zwift. Our first group run on Zwift next Tuesday, the 8th of February. Just me riding solo for the triple header, triple caution race day today. Valenciana first, then a word on Saudi and Etoile de Bessege stages three and two. Respectively, this is Valenciana stage two that we'll be recapping first. Benji is, I understand, traveling to to Luxembourg, but it's Belgium Luxembourg. And at that point, I got so confused that I had to exit the conversation. But safe travels to Benji. He might be back for the Rampas in Humanas gravel finish in Valenciana in the next few stages. But today, stage two didn't look like much of a GC day. 172 kilometers long from Batera to Torrent. We did have a collection of climbs in the middle of the stage. It reminded me of that Giro stage where Bora paced really hard. I think in 2020 for Sagan and dropped Nitsolo and some other sprinters and they had to ride like 40k to the finish and he beat Gaviria. Uh, and I thought maybe Bora would try for Matt Walls today and Christoph uh, Intermarche would try for him or if Viviani has his quick step climbing legs for Ineos, maybe they would try and drop Jakobsen there because there's a tier of sprinter right now that is or one tier that has Melier, Ewan and Jakobsen in it and We'll see how Bennett goes at Bora, but he, he should be there as well. And it's only Jakobsen here in this Valenciana race. And to be honest, the other sprinters here, like a Viviani, Nizzolo, they're not they're not maybe even in the second tier where Gronovec and style sprinters reside. So I was expecting teams to try, but they didn't, it seems. Now, coverage, it, it was a pretty cruisy stage, to be honest. There's a break uh, featuring Americans, the Stars and Stripes. Actually, I actually quite like the Ruth Winder style jersey uh, with King, Ross Kolp, Passions and Apparent for Uskotel. And it was Israel Startup Nation helping Quick Step pace all day for Nitzola, who's their new signing from Quebec, their new sprinter. And I was like, Nitzola climbed really well the back end of last year, like Sorkido to get you. I mentioned this 1.1 Basque Wednesday race about a thousand times in the last couple of weeks, but he, he won that against Algotti and Ida Schelling, punchy guys. Like he, he was climbing okay. I thought they'd be wanting to make it hard for quick step. Anyway, they didn't. Group was all together, break in hand, seemed like a relatively easy stage until Dylan turns after break was caught, lit it up, who paced. And I, I discussed with a lot of people yesterday and talked about it. Yeah, why did Bahrain pace with Dylan turns? Who I thought could almost go for GC or Bill Bow go for GC in this race, why do they pace with turns and Bilbao for Lucian Sanchez on the climb yesterday and stuff? And now he's two minutes behind. It was, it was bizarre. And drop Mohoric, who was fast in the finish. Anyway, today he attacked at 16K to go on a short rise, one of the last climbs before the finish. Then there was a fast descent, flowing corners. I was actually in Valencia uh, a week ago riding this road or the, near these roads. And yeah, it's fast, but also. Sometimes the corners come up on you quickly and an Uskatel rider crashed in a right-hander that was a bit sharper than he expected. Crashed. David Decker, then the younger Visma rider, was behind him a few wheels back and he then he had his wheel overlapped with the Total rider in front of him and that forced him to go left and he went off an edge that was pretty much unprotected into like some trees, steep, rocky. No one could see what happened to Decker. No one knew who it was, Decker, at that point. Luckily, it cut back and we saw him standing up and he got back up, brought his back bike back and he was on the road. I don't know if he's abandoned or his condition, but to even see him standing and back on the road after that sort of crash at that sort of speed was, yeah, good to see and could have been a lot worse. Dylan Turns got brought back and it was going to be a sprint. So, yeah, this is one of those days where, I don't know, I think Jakobsen maybe he's worked on the off-season. Definitely in the Vuelta, he was someone you could put under pressure on on even shorter climbs to drop, but not today. Gru came back together. Quick step were pacing. Avonapol already said before the stage that he would help Jakobsen with the lead out, and the benefit to him of that is they were at the front. So with 3.9 Ks to go, they're drilling it. Uh, they actually have a really, really stacked train here, uh, De Koenig Quick Step. They have uh, Lampart, Merku, Cherny, Catania and Honore. And yeah, even if in the yellow leader's jersey, about third wheel. 3.9 k to go. There's a crash in the bunch. Now, I, I don't know who was involved in it. 
But yeah, there was a crash. Quickstep avoided it, so it was a corollary benefit for Avonapol. Maybe that affected Nitsolo because he ended up coming 32nd in the sprint, which like even I don't expect him to be Jakobsen every time, but something must have gone wrong with him. The factor bikes, I know Greipel was doing 2,000 watts and going backwards on them, but they, they can't be that slow to be coming 32nd. Quick step dominating. Then there was a, a peanut roundabout, like a double roundabout put together, figure of eight, another like left-hand turn, and into Marche, who actually have, again, another team I thought we were going to try on the climbs. They have a decent lead-out squad here with Bistrom, the Norwegian compatriot of Kristoff, Barnabas Payak, who did a good lead-out the other day in Mallorca, I think, Pascalon, Petit, and Dimitri Kleis. And they actually took over from Quickstep. Meanwhile, Merku wasn't last man today. And it was a sort of bit of a jumble lead out for Quickstep. It wasn't the perfect one. This is one of the first times we've seen Jakobsen since his crash actually paired with Merku, uh, remembering that he was with Bert van Leeberger last time. And it was like Lampart and Honore doing a lot of the lead out for Jakobsen. Even a pole had slipped off into Marche, had Pascal on first wheel, and then Jakobsen bullied Christoph off his own lead out man's wheel second wheel, jumped at 200 metres. And if you've seen the overhead of this sprint, I guess you don't really need to see much of this race. Jakobsen obliterates Christoph, gaps him off the wheel. We had puts like 10 bike lengths into everybody and then stops pedaling at 50 metres. Comically dominant sprint. And I can't wait for the Tour de France already because uh, I think Jakobsen is, is the best sprint to quick step have. Not looking good for Cavendish. I know it's one sprint, but he already... The Fedra has intimated that it will be Jakobsen going to the to the Tour de France, and Jakobsen already looks in very very good shape, and I can't wait to see him against Ewan. And we'll talk about Ewan and his lead outs problems in in a minute. But yeah, comically dominant from Fabio Jakobsen, two in a row for De, for, uh, De Koenig Quickstep Alpsen. No, well, I, I, Alpsen got De Koenig, so it's Alpsen De Koenig and Quickstep Alpha Vinyl. Anyway, flooring products, whatever they are. Here's the top ten from this sprint. Jakobsen first, Milano second, Viviani third for Ineos, Moric fourth, and Kristoff just blew up. He was fifth. He was third wheel. He lost the wheel of Jakobsen. Then Mozzato, even a pole seventh, but I think no one was really like. Then eighth was Pasquale, who just finished the lead out. Then Lawrence Rex and Jesus Escara. So listen, not a stacked sprint field. The GC field is stronger here than the sprint field in terms of depth. But so you might think, oh, you're overreacting to. Jakobsen's win, maybe, but he, he's looking good and that wasn't even with a perfect lead out. And I think Jakobsen does have a little bit of the ability to look after himself if he feels like something's not going right. Now, Bennett used to do that when he first came over to Quick Step, and then he was like, no, I should just trust Merku 100%. And it cost him once in Paris Nice with the stage case bowl one. But generally speaking, you should just trust Merku and it'll work out for you. In fact, another counterpoint to that was Cav in the Champs Elysees stage. Didn't work out there. But yeah, Jakobsen looking good. Evenepoel still leading GC by 19 seconds ahead of Vlasov and Carlos Rodriguez. Tomorrow's stage is from Alicante to Antenas de Maimo. This is, there's been a bit of controversy about this stage actually because apparently, I think Evenepoel, well, I know that Quick Step. They were down in Valencia in January. They were wrecking this, or December and January. They were wrecking this climb because it's a new climb and they, it's gravel apparently. And Quickstep and Evenepoel were like, this road service is, is a joke. Uh, it's so bad. And also I think their GPX file, they didn't go the right way. I'm not sure exactly. I'm not sure they've even wrecked the full climb. They got there and they thought this road surface is too bad this can't actually be the right way. So don't know what's happened with that. But yeah, 155Ks. They do the Col de Rates. That's the one that very famous climb in uh, near Denia. 7Ks, 5.5% into Sacroita, which is 6Ks, 3% uh, afterwards. And then rolling climbs, the Benefalin climb. These are all shallow gradient. Shouldn't be gaps here. 11.3Ks, 4.4%. Then the Tibi climb, 4Ks, 6.6% before the final ramp to Alto de las Antenas de Magmo Tibi, 9.8 Ks, 7.5%, but the final 5.5 Ks are 10.2% with a gravel section of undetermined length in there and undetermined road surface. So maybe we'll see guys on uh, 
Maybe we see specialized hardtails brought out by Quickstep tomorrow if it's as bad as they, they said it was. Uh, but Mars looked good on a 10% climb in Valencia last year. He looked okay when he attacked on stage one until he blew up and then Avonapol countered. The question would be, I mean, Avonapol will be the favorite for this stage, obviously, given his shape on stage one. There's Vlasov, Valverde, um, and, and Mars, as I already mentioned, being the other top climbers here. And Carlos Rodriguez. I do want to see Carlos Rodriguez in the test. Like It would be a nice sort of bonus for Rodriguez here if he finished on GC the best Spanish rider in his first year after graduating from uni at Ineos Grenadiers. But the question will be, I think for me, will Quickstep be able to control this stage with the squad they have, which is very sprint heavy? They do have like Lampart and they are shallow gradient climbs. They have Cherny. On a race. So they do have the men to do it. Who will be willing to help them? You'd think maybe Movistar will send a man or two, maybe, if they're feeling generous. Uh, but, yeah, that's a uh, break control will be interesting for Quick Step. And then also, as we saw on stage one, will people want to do Avonapol's work for him? He's not going to – he doesn't have three Stavenons. He doesn't have Alaphilippe, doesn't have Van Stavenon, doesn't have Masnada. It's not, this is not a stark climbing squad. So I would suggest if I was Movistar – trying to hit him one too with Mars and Valverde and other teams as well. Uh, I know that Bora will obviously be dry, uh, riding for, for Vlasov. Can Ineos do something with, with two riders? I know Siv- they have Sivakov, Gagenhart, and Carlos Rodriguez. They have probably the strongest climbing squad here because Gagenhart's lost time. I'd expect him to fall into a domestique role. Freyla, Gagenhart, Sivakov, they can do something for Rodriguez and maybe put Avonapol under pressure there. But yeah, should be an interesting stage and keen to see how Avonapol goes on a longer climb. This won't be a 12-minute effort. I think this will be over a 20-minute effort uh, tomorrow. But that was Valenciana. Just another example. Just just write it down. And I know this is classic armchair DS and I, I'm not there at the park, you know, seeing the parkour and having asking the riders to do these sort of things. But... I just feel like it's a missed opportunity when you have these hills and maybe say did try and they gave up. But if you don't try on these earlier hills when you do have Schelling, Zvihoff, Gamper type riders, Bora in particular, then you're not going to win. Like you're just very, very unlikely to win with Jakobsen. And if you just do things in a certain way that take your odds of winning from 10% to just 17%, if you do that over every race across the year, you will win more races in the aggregate. But that was Volterella Comunitat Valenciana. A word on our show partner, Zwift, before we proceed to the Saudi tour mention. Busy lives, including today when I was, you know, triple-headed. Couldn't go out for my regular Vulture visit because I had to watch Passage straight after Saudi, then Valenciana. Meant that it's hard to find time for getting on the bike outside. Spending a lot of time watching cycling and not enough time actually riding kind of describes my year last year. Uh, I'm not sure about Benji either, but yeah, I know. It's, uh, we, we watch a lot of cycling and then have to record podcasts. So we have a lot of events stacked for LRCP on a regular basis, a weekly group rides starting from next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Uh, UK time, 7 p.m. European time. That starts next Tuesday, Q&A ride. The event description is down below. And, yeah, I'm just enjoying being able to get onto Zwift to get a workout in on demand or just, just cruise around, to be honest. Like I did the Innsbruck World's course, doing the Richmond's course, got me thinking about how are these uh, how are these comparable to what, what will the Wollongong course look like compared to Richmond where, I was, where Sagan went solo or Innsbruck, uh, where Avonapol obviously broke out in the junior road race. But thanks to Zwift for supporting the podcast. And as I said, go and check them out down below. You can get a free seven-day trial if you sign up through the link in the description. On to Saudi tour. This was crosswind chaos, apparently, because that was all before footage started. We had a sprint stage. I had you in it like better than odds on, and I thought he was going to win this easily. But that didn't happen because there was 185 Ks and Rudiger Selig, he crashed early on and we saw footage of him. This is the second last man for Lotto who came over from Bora Hansgrohe to join Lotto Sudal. He crashed. We saw him eating like his lunch pretty banged up with about 50 Ks to go. So when coverage started, the race said apparently, according to Seb PK, 
who's race radio for the Tour de France and also there at Saudi Tour, the race had been completely blown apart and had just come back together. Butrago, I think, had been dropped. But we had in the front group Groenewegen, Ewan, Gaviria, uh, and a few other sprinters. But really, it was, it was bike exchange versus Ewan if it came down to a sprint. And the thorn in sort of those two teams' side was Koenig Quickstep had a lot of numbers. They had Ballerini there, but they correctly knew they're like, we are not going to win a sprint against Caleb Bjorn, or very unlikely to with Davide Ballerini, particularly the shape he showed in the other stage. They had Kesa, de Klerk, Van Leeberger, and Ballerini. And we knew it was just a matter of time. Like it was heavy crosswinds, 40 k's to go, absolute lull. Turgis, poor guy. Like I'm talking, you, should, you go and see the footage. I do have the highlight video of this. The headwind or cross headwind with sand whipping up into his face, he looked like the most miserable solo break I've ever seen in my entire life. And I was like, he must be cooked. And he was, but they were just dangling. So the last 40Ks went so, so slowly. Anyway, Quickstep did try late in the last sort of 10Ks. They just hit the front with four guys. And I think the mistake that was made was... I don't know who it was last wheel, but the the last quick step guy didn't he didn't lose the wheel, and I felt felt like if he lost it there, there was three or four guys in front of him on his own team or quick step mounting this attack. Maybe they get away, maybe maybe they then win the stage, or they only bring two guys with them who aren't great sprinters. But that didn't happen. Got closed down. Bahrain did really well, and I want to just shout out a guy who I did mention in the he's a new transfer for Bahrain, Kamil Gradek. And Philip Mazuriuk, two Polish riders. Gradek was on Vini. He's like a veteran sort of Conti ruler guy. He was prominent in this race, closing down moves. They also have Butrago in the leader's jersey. And then after this, there was a counter. So Quickstep got caught countered again with another couple of riders. Butrago, uh, presumably 60 kilo Colombian, in the saddle seat, it closed it down, shut it down. And that was it for this for the, any sort of more attempts from Tacona Quick Step. The trains assembled and it was going to be bike exchange in their Gerald Steiner kit on the left hand side against Lotto Sudal, who were again waiting. The problem for Lotto Sudal was they had their 2021 train again, because which is Jesper de Bois' last man, Roger Kluger's second last man, which didn't deliver you in very consistently last year. And uh, yeah, with no Rudiger Selig. And Rudiger Selig in stage one, second last man, seemed to make a lot of difference. So Bike Exchange got this lead out right. They came a bit later. Kluger hit the front with like 1,300, 1,400 metres to go, maybe even earlier. Almost when he hit the front, when he's in his third to last man, 1,600 metre roll, but he's second last man here. And then Ryan Mullen came up on the right for uh, Bora Hansgrohe. They were sprinting for, Bo- uh, for Danny Van Poppel. But Bike Exchange came later. Luca Mez gets left Groenewegen, like maybe on the front a little bit early. But he, did, he, he didn't have Ewan on the wheel. Ewan, Du Bois lost Kluger's wheel. He got pinched, and it was the same old story. It was like that UAE to a stage, I don't know, six, when they had the sea wall or sea breeze to the left-hand side, and Ewan got pinched and just couldn't get out. And we, you look at the overhead, Ewan and Du Bois just could not get him out from being boxed in, and Groenewegen opened up. And he, listen, not the most dominant sprint in the world, but a good win, good positioning from Mezgetz. And you look at who was on Groenewegen's wheel, he should be beating those riders 10 out of 10 times, McClay van Poppel Dainese. And Ewan came, the fa- Ewan was the fastest, but he literally didn't get open air until 25 minutes to go. So the lead out problems rearing its head again for Lotto. That being said, we wouldn't have expect. you know, they couldn't have predicted Zelig crashing. With Zelig there, maybe things would have been different. But the first win for Dylan Groenewegen and his new team, Bike Exchange, Jayco, and, and Luca Mezgetz. I want to give a big, he must be happy. Luca Mezgetz, the Slovenian, did a lot of lead outs last year <laughs> for no results, finally gets a, a W for his efforts for the team. So Groenewegen takes that sprint. And actually, with Ewan not taking enough bonus seconds, he doesn't take the leader's jersey off Petrago. I thought he would because I thought Ewan would come at least second and then he, he'd probably have enough bonus seconds to take it off Petrago. He didn't. Top 10, by the way, Groenewegen, McClay, Ewan, Van Poppel, Danese, Gavidia, Erland, Blickra for Unox, De Bois, Consoni, Ballerini for Quickstep, Alpha Vinyl. That was Saudi Tour. Tomorrow stage there. It's actually got like a rampas in Humanas. Like I've never seen something like this. 
I mean, Hatter Dam, which is a 500 meter, 12 percent punch, does have nothing on this. It's roll. It's sort of flat terrain for 140 k's, and then according to the profile, it's three k's at 11 and a half percent for an eight and a half k plateau. So this will be GC time. This will be Potrago, Charmig, Rui Costa. Like not the most stacked GC field, but it'll be interesting to see how Butrago goes defending it. He definitely looks very, very strong. Lotto also have Maxim Van Hills as their GC man, and so we'll see how he goes as well. Uh, but yeah, I think Butrago is looking looking pretty good, and he said this is a big goal for him winning GC. Etoile de Bassege, two one race, but it does have a lot of World Tour teams here, including Cofidis, Trek, etc. Again, a pretty straightforward stage. We had three sprints today, but this was an uphill sprint. 1,600 meters, 6.3% to finish. There was a break. The break got caught. EF and Trek were pacing all day, and this climb just wasn't hard enough for Molima. I think maybe Molima's not in great condition either. I mean, he was in February last year at Loguelia, but this looked more like Mads Pedersen territory, and Pedersen obviously won the stage yesterday, was in the leader's jersey, and EF were pacing for Betiol. Now, Betiol, good rider, very strong, repeated efforts in an all-out punch. Not his forte, I don't think. And I was I was thinking Magnus Court would be would be their man today. Obviously, Betiol is the one they want for GC, but it is interesting how Court just, just not on at the moment. I mean, and riders aren't usually consistently dominant throughout the year. Some guys are more consistently winning all the time, but Court... Not looking, certainly not in his welter, in his welter self, where he'd be top ten here easily. But went to a sprint, and a rider that two riders that have been very very strong the last couple of days, who let it out early. Although that was it was Johansson, the young Norwegian who won Lavenir last year. Tobias Johansson started the climb hard early. There was also a UAE rider, I think maybe Ulysses or someone else leading up for Ulysses because they wanted to make it as long as possible to get rid of the proper sprinters like Pedersen and I thought you know Ulysses 1600 meters six percent but this is in France it's not in Italy therefore Ulysses like gets a hard nerf and that's what happened today Uh, Johannesson looked good but it was actually Cockard and Pedersen who waited and waited were in good position Pedersen in better position second wheel Cockard a little bit deeper they were attacked a little bit again by uh, Bergado Matthew Bergado, who's a French rider on Total Energy, who was kind of competing against Lawless himself yesterday. He's he says according to PCS, he's like 5'6, 61 kilos. Maybe he's a bit bigger than that. But yeah, looking like a a Conti, good solid Conti pro Conti puncher. He also looked good, but it was Pedersen that went very, very early. He timed it well yesterday, going on the the steepest part is where he expended most of his effort. But Cockard. Came from behind, a little bit lighter, well, a lot lighter than Pedersen, actually. I thought Pedersen was going to pinch him to the right-hand side, but just got past Cockard, and on the flat last 30 metres, went past Pedersen, takes his first win on Cofidis, where he's come from B&B to the World Tour team now. Same time as Pedersen, though. Johannesson third. Bergado on the same time as well, fourth. Then Bessiol on four seconds, fifth. Then Benjamin Thomas, Madame Menton, Champoussin, Pierre Latour and Corbin Strong, who, if you remember the interview with Kellen O'Brien, said that Corbin Strong for Israel Premier Tech, Neopro, doesn't mind a hill in a race. Now, he might not be winning on hills, but he's a decent sprinter type and just one to watch that decent top 10 result there. Then Ulysses J. Vine, 12th. Uh, Carapaz looked all right and then got dropped. In terms of GC, Bertiol's looking... Pretty good. He's on 21 seconds off Pedersen. We do have a much harder stage on Saturday where it will be too hard for Pedersen. Tomorrow, though, Bessage to Bessage, 156 Ks, a 5.3 K climb at 4%, then a 2.4 K climb at 6.5%, close to the finish. I don't know. Pedersen's looking good. If I'm Trek, I would control this, and I think Pedersen should be the favorite again for this stage. If they can control this stage and he's climbing well, I think Pedersen's looking very, very good uh, at the Sege, and I'm, I think they will try and control this and try and make sure those climbs are done at a steady tempo. And if if they don't, if the other teams don't drop him, he will be difficult to beat in the shape he is looking in. Otherwise, it, it's a pretty 
light sprint field apart from Pascal Ackerman, who's not really been competitive the last couple of days. Can he get over those climbs? We do have Court as well, but he's not looked good. Impy, but as I said, I think Pedersen looking pretty good if, if they can't drop him on that final climb. Maybe I'm misreading it. Maybe it'll be a, a break and someone will attack and they're out of GC and they'll take 15, 20 seconds. That's also possible. Look out for Filippo Baroncini on Trek Neo Pro. That's the sort of thing he's done at the U23 level. And I wouldn't be surprised to see him try there or, or Jay Vine as well. But I hope you enjoyed the podcast, the recap of all those stages. I do miss Benji. It's, it's, so, it's harder than it looks riding solo and uh, as well just watching three races in a row. I can't believe already we have Jakobsen, Avonapol, Bertiol, Carapaz already in February fighting it out. But yeah, busy February. Hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you all or as many of you as possible hopefully at the first LRCP's with Ride next Tuesday on the 8th of February. Thanks for listening. Bye.